Our Father in heaven, I thank you, Father, for the grace of having the bodies filling this room and for the study uh, to be continuing in this dependable, consistent fashion, not just through the Ezra, Father, but through all the years you've let us use this place. And thank you for the service and the encouragement, the laughter, the friendship, the prayers, the financial support, all the ways in which you have allowed this, this group to uh, make possible what we do in ministry as we teach your word, Father. You've made all this possible. It's your word. It's your spirit. It's your community of believers. It's your provision. It's your wisdom that guides us to do what we do, Father. We just are the, the vessels you have filled. But what a, what a blessing it is that you have chosen to do that with us. And it's a blessing, Father, that has eternity in front of it. We have only just begun to understand who you are, only just begun to serve you, only just begun to enjoy you. And we ask, Father, that, that with the time you've left us here, we'd make the most of it, tonight being one more opportunity to do that, to be aware of your word in a new and better way, to consider it more deeply, to give concern to our own life and how we live according to what we learn, that we would uh, take seriously, Father, the responsibility you entrust with us in carrying the, the gospel forward outside this room. All these things, Father, you have given us the privilege to do. I pray that be, it would be our heart above all that we concern ourselves with and that tonight, Father, would only increase those desires. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, last week we reached the end of the beginning of the story we're following through Ezra and Nehemiah, the end of the beginning of the restoration of Israel, the Lord restoring the nation back from a period of discipline when he had scattered them, God stirring the hearts of the people of Israel to return after he had earlier stirred the heart of the king of Persia to release them from captivity. And now 50,000 Jews have traveled into the land of Jerusalem. And up till last week, we saw them rebuild the temple. And as that first band of refugees arrived in what was left of Jerusalem, they made a crude altar. They began to worship the Lord. And we noticed that that represented or reflected the first step of restoration. God is commonly at work doing in the hearts of individuals, not only in the case of Israel, but in the case of each individual person. In the case of Israel, he brought Jews back to the heart of worship. He brought them back in circumstances where there were no frills, no distractions, just the people with hearts to worship the Lord in thankfulness, totally dependent on God. That was God's way of reorienting their hearts following a period of discipline. Now they show the response he expects, a true heart of worship and a diligence to finish the task they gave. And as we're moving along, we've noted that Israel's experience can serve as a pattern for the way God will restore his children at any point in time, in any age. And we've noticed, for example, that the first step the Lord took Israel through was this step of taking them from rebellion to a point where it reignited their desire for true worship. And that reminds us that before anything else, we have to be brought back to a place where we can appreciate the Lord for who he is and what he has done. That's the beginning of any good work of God in our hearts. That's the step we've watched up through this point, up to the point where God orchestrates that first six chapters of Ezra. So tonight we move to step two of a restoration framework, the one that we're following here. Step two, in which God restores his people yet further. What we know so far is the people of Israel have built this temple. They've rebuilt the temple in accordance with the Lord's request. They've uh, persevered despite opposition. They eventually finished. Now that temple stands in Jerusalem, though it's far less impressive than the one that Solomon built. Nevertheless, it's there. And you have a physical house of worship now standing as metaphor for the work God is doing in the hearts of the people, rebuilding them, bringing them back as a testimony to his faithfulness. But then the question comes, what next? Once they've been brought through this time of, of reestablishing true worship in their hearts. Well, in God's plan of restoration, these people have returned to him. They've obeyed his instructions to rebuild the temple. But now they need to be instructed in how to live according to what he has begun in their hearts. And that begins with Ezra's arrival in Jerusalem. So in chapter 7, step 2 of the restoration, it begins, much as step 1 did, with a return of a main character and a band or a caravan of followers. Look at chapter 7, verses 1 through 9. Now after these things, in the reign of Artaxerxes, king of Persia, there went up from Ezra the son of Sarariah, son of Azariah, son of Hilkiah, son of Shalom, son of Zadok, son of Ahutub, son of Amariah, son of Azariah, son of Maruth, 
son of Zerahiah, son of Uzai, son of Bukai, son of Abishua, son of Phinehas, son of Eleazar, son of Aaron, the chief priest. This Ezra went up from Babylon, and he was a scribe skilled in the law of Moses, which the Lord God of Israel had given. And the king granted him all he requested because the hand of the Lord his God was upon him. He came to Jerusalem in the fifth month, which was in the seventh year of the king. For on the first of the first month, he began to go up from Babylon. And on the first of the fifth month, he came to Jerusalem because the good hand of his God was upon him. Well, chapter seven of Ezra takes place 58 years after the close of chapter six. So you might note in your Bibles, there's a gap of 58 years between chapter six and chapter seven. When we last studied in chapter six, we noted we were in the time of Darius, the first king of Persia. Darius ruled the Persian Empire well, and he put an end to all the rebellion that had marked his predecessor's reign over the nation, over the empire. He united the empire under his rule. And then he proceeded to subdivide that kingdom into 20 divisions. They called their divisions satrapies, of which the leader was called the satrap. The satrap, or nobleman, acted as a little king in authority over his respective division. Darius was a man who built a lot of things during his time and reign. He built an extensive road system. He built a huge palace near the Red Sea. All in all, he brought a lot of great prosperity to the nation of Persia. His son, Xerxes, succeeded him in 486 B.C. He's the king that married Esther. And as we said at the beginning of this study, all the events of the book of Esther take place in the 58 years between chapter 6 and chapter 7. So if you were to put the books in chronological order, go find the um, book of Esther in your Bible and rip it out and stuff it right here between chapter 6 and chapter 7. Now, maybe you don't want to do that, but that's what effectively has happened. Under... Xerxes, under Darius' son, rebellions reemerged in the Persian kingdom. Eventually, the Greeks came sailing from Greece. That's where Greeks uh, come from. And they destroyed a third of the Persian naval fleet, forcing the Persian forces to withdraw from Europe. And eventually, Xerxes was assassinated. The younger son of Xerxes, Artaxerxes, assumes power in 464 B.C., Artaxerxes killed his older brother to gain access to the throne. He couldn't stop the decline of Persia, however, as the Greeks and the Egyptians and others in Asia Minor all rebelled and eventually took control of their respective regions from Persia. One satrap remained firmly in Persia's grasp in the region near Egypt, and that was the province of Yehud, or as we would say, Judah. Ezra departs, we're told, from Babylon and returns to Jerusalem to join the exiles in the city. And he introduces himself here with his genealogy. In doing so, he's establishing his credibility for what will follow in the story. Because, as you could note, he has a pretty impressive lineage. He traces his ancestry all the way back to the first priest, to Aaron. His name is a shortened version of Azariah, which you noticed a couple of times in his lineage, a man with the same name. And Azariah means Yahweh helps. And that is Ezra's full proper name. Because he descends from Aaron, he is a priest and he is a scribe. A scribe is a communicator in every sense of the word. It would mean he wrote, he copied, he taught the word of God. And in fact, historically, he's credited with reestablishing and even redefining the role of scribe in Israel after he comes back from the exile. Because before the exile, scribes, in Israel would serve as messengers, they could serve as military officers, they were often cabinet officials to kings, they could do a whole bunch of things. But after Ezra's day, scribes became uniquely associated with studying, writing, and teaching God's word and nothing else. And they did so because of Ezra's model. In verse 6, Ezra declares that the Lord's hand had been upon him to bring an opportunity for him to join the exiles in Jerusalem. And he begins to leave Babylon, we're told, on the first of the first month. That's the month of Nisan. He didn't actually leave Babylon, though, until the 12th of Nisan. And we'll learn that when we get into chapter 8, which would mean that Ezra departs Babylon, finally goes outside the borders at around Passover. How would you feel if you were captive for decades in a foreign land and then you were set free right around the 4th of July? That's probably how the Jews felt whenever they read Ezra's account because his departure from Babylon 
corresponds with the Exodus and is marked by a festival Passover, which has as its national significance a moment of freedom for the nation. So he's departing in almost a reenactment of the 4th of July or what we would think of as a 4th of July or the Passover celebration. And he says, with God's grace, he completed what was a 900 mile journey in only four months, certainly by God's grace. So why does Ezra leave for Jerusalem so long after the earlier exiles had reached the city? Well, the next verse tells us why. Verse 10, for Ezra had set his heart to study the law of the Lord and to practice it and to teach his statutes and ordinances in Israel. This is perhaps one of the more memorable and inspiring verses of the Old Testament. First, notice the verse begins with the word for, which indicates this is the reason for his departure. Why does he leave Babylon? Well, because for. And then I want you to also notice the verse ends with the phrase in Israel. So Ezra is determined to serve the people in Israel in these three ways, which is the reason why he must leave Babylon and go to Israel. Ezra was a man who had set his heart to three things, it says, to three priorities. First, he says, he set his heart to study the law of the Lord, or the Torah, and literally in Hebrew this says Torah. Specifically, that references the books that Moses wrote, or the book that Moses wrote, technically. But often Jews will call the whole of their Old Testament the Torah because the word Torah literally means instruction of God. So it's not uncommon for someone to just generalize their Old Testament, for a Jew to generalize the Old Testament or the scriptures by calling it Torah. I study Torah. And they aren't necessarily meaning that they only study the first five books. So we should understand the meaning here to be that Ezra had begun to study all of what was the word of God for him in that day. All the prophets, the Psalms, and of course the book that Moses wrote. Secondly, Ezra committed to practicing it, to living it, to obeying it. It didn't satisfy Ezra to simply know what the word said. Many men will do that today and and have always done that, pursuing the knowledge of God. Some even choose to do it through the word of God. But Ezra knew he had to live according to what he read, to what he learned. Otherwise, any teaching he would do would be hypocritical and it would lack authority because we know godliness is a product of knowing and practicing the word of God, not merely one of those. Finally, Ezra taught what he knew to others in Israel, and in doing so, he became an instrument to encourage others to obey it. Israel has always had many teachers. They always will. They often have teachers that are false and self-serving. But Ezra was a man who combined sincere knowledge, a model of obedience, and a heart to serve others with the truth. Now, many Christians have come to this verse, and they held it up as a model for how all Christians are to place a priority on the word of God, and rightly so. We can certainly learn something from the example of a godly man who would make a priority of learning and of practicing and of teaching others the word of God. We understand this is a model for any mature Christian. And we acknowledge, I think, without a second thought that every Christian should aspire to what Ezra says he's here to do, or at least every Christian would like to think they do. But when you make that application, I think we actually diminish Ezra's example. Ezra isn't the ordinary Christian or saint, to use the Old Testament term. And the vast majority of Christians are not even called to be like Ezra, much less expected to get there. Take a second look at the start of that verse. Ezra set his heart on doing these things. To set your heart on something means to focus all your desire, all your energy, and all your purpose on something. To place everything else second. To literally be consumed in the pursuit of that something. While you and I may like to ski occasionally, Olympic skiers set their heart on skiing. While you and I might enjoy playing guitar, for example, Carlos Santana set his heart on playing. You and I might enjoy taking a mission trip to Africa, but missionaries set their heart on living in Africa. And while you and I might have a love for studying and living and even teaching God's word, Ezra set his heart upon it which very few in our day do. Very few have ever done. And I believe only a few are ever called to do that. Everyone is called to study the Bible. Everyone is called to be obedient to the word. Everyone is called to share or witness or teach to a degree what they know. But only a few, in my experience, are called to set these three things above virtually everything else in their lives, to make sacrifice for these three things, to set aside everything else so they can do these things, to serve God's people at a level and with a dedication that puts them in a different category. They are the Olympians of Bible study, if you will. And we are all the ones who benefit from their dedication, just as Israel is about to benefit from Ezra's dedication to his task. Ezra turned his back on his life 
and on his family and whatever else he had holding him to Babylon. And he moved like a missionary would to some place that was, frankly, not a great place to live in his day. And he did it so that he could do what? Study, obey and teach God's word. So it's not that we can't aspire to this. If we feel called to it, we absolutely must. But we should neither diminish, though, what it means for someone to do what we're seeing here so that we don't tend to treat all those who would study or teach equally in that sense. There are those in our community who are the men, I think, who follow in Ezra's path. They're the ones we we look up to and say, if it were not for those men or women in some cases, what I would have would be far different than what I have now. So we know why Ezra left. He left because God put on his heart a call that he could not refuse and one that caused him to devote his entire life to what God had put in his heart. We need people like that. That's why God gives us people like that. So if that's why he left, it still doesn't answer the question of what triggered his departure. Well, once again, Israel explains in the next section by relating the letter of a Persian king, this time Artaxerxes, like before, this one's written in Aramaic, but I'm going to translate it for you into English. Verse 11. Now, this is the copy of the decree which King Artaxerxes gave to Ezra, the priest, the scribe, learned in the words of the commandments of the Lord and his statutes to Israel. Quote, Artaxerxes, king of kings, to Ezra, the priest, the scribe of the law of God of heaven, perfect peace. And now I have issued a decree that any of the people of Israel and their priests and the Levites in my kingdom who are willing to go to Jerusalem may go with you for as much as you are sent by the king and his seven counselors to inquire concerning Judah and Jerusalem, according to the law of your God, which is in your hand, and to bring the silver and gold, which the king and his counselors have freely offered to the God of Israel, whose dwelling is in Jerusalem, with all the silver and gold which you find in the whole province of Babylon, along with the free will offering of the people and of the priests who offered willingly for the house of their God, which is in Jerusalem. With this money, therefore, you shall diligently buy bulls, rams, and lambs with their grain offerings and their drink offerings, and offer them on the altar of the house of your God, which is in Jerusalem. Whatever seems good to you and to your brothers to do with the rest of the silver and gold, you may do according to the will of your God. Also the utensils which are given to you for the service of the house of your God, deliver in full before the God of Jerusalem. The rest of the needs for the house of your God, for which you may have occasion to provide, provide for it from the royal treasury. I, and even I, King Artaxerxes, issue a decree to all the treasurers who are in the provinces beyond the river, that whatever Ezra the priest and the scribe of the law of the God of heaven may require of you, it shall be done diligently, even up to 100 talents of silver, 100 cores of wheat, 100 baths of wine. I didn't know you could take a bath of wine, but it <laughs> suddenly sounds very interesting. 100 baths of oil and salt is needed. Whatever is commanded by the God of heaven, let it be done with zeal for the house of the God of heaven, so that there will not be wrath against the kingdom of the king and his sons. We also inform you that it is not allowed to impose tax, tribute, or toll on any of the priests, Levites, singers, doorkeepers, Nethanim, or servants of this house of God. You, Ezra, according to the wisdom of your God, which is in your hand, appoint magistrates and judges that they may judge all the people who are in the province beyond the river, even all those who know the laws of your God. And you may teach anyone who is ignorant of them. Whoever will not observe the law of your God and the law of the king, let judgment be executed upon him strictly, whether for death or for banishment or for confiscation of goods or for imprisonment. Once again, Ezra records this letter from a Persian king, once again in Aramaic. And the king's orders sound again very familiar because they sound a lot like Darius's order. And in fact, it may likely be that his order is based in large part on what Darius had written earlier in his edict. And he gives Ezra the right first to leave for Israel. And then secondly, to bring with him any other Jew who might want to come along with him, particularly among the priests. This group is going to be well funded out of the Persian treasury. And Ezra goes with the power of the king to enforce both the law of God and, you notice, he also says the laws of Persia. And in fact, what Ezra has become through this edict is the king's representative in the land. He is effectively the satrap. And he has the power within that province to appoint judges to rule over the land. Now, at first glance, I think it's natural to wonder why the king has granted Ezra and Israel so much wealth and independence and, and rights in this case, seemingly out of the blue. You might ask, did the Lord stir his heart like he did Cyrus's heart? Well, there's no indication of that here. Certainly the Lord is working in everything, so he's somewhere involved. We know that. But the point is he's not called out specifically as having initiated this move on Artaxerxes' part. 
I think there's a good political reason here that actually explains the timing more so than anything else we see. In 460 B.C., the armies of the pre-Alexandrian Greeks returned and attacked Persia with 200 warships. They captured Egypt and the coasts of Palestine and Phoenicia. Palestine and Phoenicia are what are the present day shores of Israel. They capture Egypt and the coastlines in 459 B.C. And then it's the very next year, 458, that Artaxerxes orders Israel to go down into Israel and take more Jews with you and take a bunch of money and set up judges and be my representative. It would make sense then that the Persian king has sent a well-funded group of pro-Persian Jews into the land to shore up his southern flank against the Greeks. And this group would be led by a hand-picked leader with the backing of the king, with all of the authority to rule in his place. So he's essentially become the Persian satrap for the governor in that region of Persia. And he's to hold that territory for the king. It's important to Artaxerxes that those families that are living there remain loyal to the Persian government. It would seem as though some of these families were picked to go down there and reinforce the fact that, hey, you've still got family back in Persia. Meaning, if you rebel, you've got distant family who might receive negative treatment from the king as a result. You have incentive to remain loyal to the king of Persia. As it happened, a few years later, the Persians and the Greeks signed a peace treaty, and that ended hostilities for a time. Going back to the letter, the king authorizes more utensils, more wealth, gives it all to Ezra for the priest's use in the temples. I think these may have been additional artifacts that were overlooked in the original exile, or maybe these are new ones that have been created by the Jews living in exile because they were always building implements for their temple. Additionally, he says there's going to be tax breaks, there's going to be support from the treasury, and so on. The king is doing everything he can to ingratiate himself to these exiles. In fact, it says Ezra was granted a stipend to continue teaching the law to the people. So he's an employee. And in the end, the king authorizes whatever will keep Israel content and strong, you can have. Ezra's effect on Israel is going to be several things. First, he's going to organize a government when he shows up, a system of justice, a rule of law, none of which is fully established in that region of Israel to this point. He's going to appoint magistrates. He's going to appoint judges to judge the people of Israel. But, of course, if there are going to be judges, then the people first have to know what's expected of them under the law. So now that means you automatically need to start teaching people about the law. And the law we're talking about, of course, is the law of God that will rule over the Israelites. His second purpose is to then reestablish religious education. So you set up government and law. Then you have religious education and making it a principle of Jewish society. He is to teach the people who are ignorant of God's law. Where lawlessness exists, Ezra then is also to bring punishment, to bring people into conformance with the law. So everything Ezra said he set his heart on, he is to ask others to follow him in doing. He's to learn it, they're to learn it. He's to obey it, they're to obey it. And he is to teach it and they are to receive it. Remember the way the Lord brought discipline to the nation of Israel in the first place? As they're taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar, there were three steps, three movements of God. First, he removed the leadership. Then the literary class, that is the teachers. Finally, he eliminated the temple and the city walls, which effectively ended their opportunity to worship. So it was leadership, it was instruction, it was worship. And now look at the steps we watch coming back. Worship, now teaching. And of course, what's the book of Nehemiah about? Leadership. So he's restoring them in the chiastic pattern and an opposite pattern of what he did as he removed it. But with each restoration, he's rebuilding it, refashioning it in the form that it should have been in and doing it in a sincere way in their hearts. So the physical things that will change are representative of the heart things that will change. So in this case, you have the physical temple being built to represent the heart of worship. In Ezra's day now, we're about to study the restoration of instruction and justice and obedience and knowledge of God as represented by the physical things of judges and magistrates and law courts and the rest and teachers. But, of course, that's a representation of us becoming students of God's word. Lastly, you'll have city walls and structure being built. But the truth is you'll be seeing a man building up the people of Israel as a leader. There was a similar pattern, by the way, in Exodus. The people were moved out of captivity first as these ones left captivity in Babylon. What was the first thing they were taught to do as they left captivity? How to worship. They were taken to a place of worship. What was the next thing that happened? They were given a law. What was the next thing that happened? They were then given leaders, kings and the like, as the nation 
established itself in the land. This is a great opportunity for us to ask questions about this pattern in our own life. In other words, we're not Israel, but on an individual level, what does this look like? We've already said God will discipline his children. Hebrews says that that is a given. And he does it so that we can be rebuilt in ways that suit his desires. And his first priority in that restoration is to produce that heart of worship. We understand that it's not just a weekly gathering. It's not just singing and study, etc. It's a daily life living in praise and sacrifice and service to God. Okay, that's step one. Well, then comes step two. If you don't slide backward from step one, if you persevere in that pursuit of God in a true way, there will come a point where you have to go beyond simply that stage of worship. We have to re-engage the mind to go with the heart. Our desire to worship God in spirit must be matched with a commitment to know God in truth. And so that becomes the second stage of anyone's growth in maturity as a Christian, to know him according to how he revealed himself. If you want a simple picture of how God's call to worship is always followed by a call to know and follow him through his word, I want you to consider perhaps your own salvation process, or if not yours, the one you may have seen with others, or the one we often see with others who come to faith. In the initial stage of someone's coming to faith and their salvation, they're overtaken by grace. They are made aware of the love of God. They are praising his name. They're calling out to the Lord in repentance and in thanks. And as they begin to express the thankful heart that is made new in Christ, they're going to have some limited understanding of what's happening and why they feel the way they do. And they'll know the cross. They'll know resurrection. They'll know the grace of God at some level. That's the normal process. And all the while, their heart is rejoicing. And in that sense, worshiping that phase of worship and praise is probably the full extent of someone's Christian experience for at least a time. You know, you always meet these people who have been saved recently and they're the most on fire for Jesus. Right. But to use an old Air Force term, they're all thrust and no vector. They have they have all this energy and this enjoyment of God and they want to share with people, but they don't have the beginning of clue of how they actually plug in and do that thing well. And it's not so important that they know that right away. It's fine that they are who they are as a babe in Christ. But there comes a time to mature. Then God begins to put new expectations on your heart. And having come to faith, you'll be challenged from that point to get into God's word. Perhaps someone will encourage you. Perhaps you'll discover it yourself somehow. Either way, it's the Lord leading you into step two. Because the times are short. Paul says in Ephesians 5, 15 through 17, Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time, because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. That is a call to maturity in the knowledge of your faith. The proper and expected course of development for any Christian is to be carefully discipled in the study of God's word, combined, of course, with a diligence to obey it. And it's no different than, than you see here in the nation of Israel. God is bringing Ezra to educate them on his word and then giving Ezra authority to ensure that it's followed. A knowledge of God's truth combined with a commitment to follow it are essentials to the godly life that pleases God. You cannot mature as a Christian absent a study of God's word. You can become more experienced. You can become more practiced. Whatever rituals, whatever Christianese comes your way. But you can't actually spiritually mature without a study of God's word. Well, you might ask here, what would have happened to Israel had God not sent Israel down to Israel? They might have continued in their pattern of worship for a time. They would have kept doing what they knew to do. But that couldn't have lasted. In time, their hearts are going to grow cold. Their worship is going to become lifeless and stale and ultimately self-serving. Their flesh would have led them away to other gods. I mean, it did anyway. And the progress would have been lost. So unless God does the next step, there's no possibility for them to mature into something else. And the same thing happens to Christians today, sadly, at least some. Christians can be drawn away into experiences that emphasize emotion and style over knowledge and substance. And they are drawn by the love of God initially, responding in worship initially, but they soon find themselves in a setting where they're never challenged to move beyond that initial stage of Christianity. As the writer of Hebrews warns, they are not pressing on. It doesn't happen automatically. Press on to maturity. And he says in Hebrews 5, 11 through 14, concerning him, referring back to Melchizedek, he says, concerning him, we have much to say. And it's hard to explain since you've become lazy or dull of hearing. For though by this time... You ought to be teachers. You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. 
And you have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, who because of practice have their senses trained to discern good and evil. So the effect, the writer says, of remaining in this step one, if you remain stuck, as it is, in step one of restoration, that Christian growth becomes dull, a lazy to use the word that the writer uses. We don't progress. And what the writer says we ought to progress toward as a group is to teach. And I think that goes to the point of what Ezra says. He wanted to know so he could obey and then he could teach. And teach doesn't require that we all be teachers, capital T. It just implies we have a certain maturity and knowledge that we can share. So we want to progress to that point. We don't want to remain as infants. And in fact, it would seem to me from what I read in Hebrews 5 that there's an implication if you don't progress, you regress that you can return, as it is, because he says you have need again to be taught certain things. It would seem that if you don't use it, you lose it. It's not merely the case that you get somewhere and stop. You may get somewhere and go backward. And in that infantile condition, he says, we lack the ability to discern good from evil. In other words, we become vulnerable to false teaching, to schemes of the enemy, to temptations. So it's not merely that we choose to do wrong. We become inevitably one who will fall to temptation or to schemes because we're not prepared to handle them properly. So when the meat of God's word isn't the staple in our spiritual life, we are subsisting on junk food. Eventually, eating junk food catches up to you. When God sent Ezra to teach, the expectation was that the nation of Israel would learn through his influence and therefore they would grow spiritually stronger. That's where you see the grace of God in this. Why does he want us to learn and be taught so that we can become stronger, so that we can live in a more pleasing way for him, which ultimately only results in reward for us? Blessing and reward. It's all to our own benefit in eternal terms. God's restoring his children patiently here, carefully. And once their heart is set for worship, it's time to work on the mind. And so God sends his teachers. That's another piece of evidence of the love of God. And Ezra even says that himself. Look at verses 27 and 28. He says, Blessed be the Lord, the God of our fathers, who has put such a thing as this in the king's heart, to adorn the house of the Lord which is in Jerusalem, and has extended loving kindness to me before the king and his counselors and before all the king's mighty princes. And thus I was strengthened according to the hand of the Lord my God upon me. And I gathered leading men from Israel to go up with me. So the return of Israel to Jerusalem was the fulfillment of his promise when he spoke all the way back in Jeremiah. And in the fact that it comes about this way, it is self-evidently a miraculous event that they are returned to the land, that they've been freed and More so the fact that their own captors not only permit the exodus, but they finance it. All of this is certain evidence of God's hand at work. It's not merely enough that they found themselves able to leave. It's the way God ushered them out that speaks proof that the Lord himself was working to fulfill his promises here. He didn't want us to mistake that this timing of 70 years is not coincidence. He said it, he did it, and the proof of it isn't even the way it happened. It's providence. It's not luck. So Ezra leads a second wave of exiles back to Jerusalem. Now, they're leaving of Babylon and they're entering into Jerusalem is chapter 8. We'll begin there. Chapter 8, we'll read verses 1 through 14. Now, these are the heads of their fathers' households and the genealogical enrollment of those who went up with me from Babylon in the reign of King Artaxerxes. Of the sons of Phinehas, Gershom. Of the sons of Ithamar, Daniel. Of the sons of David, Hattush. Of the sons of Shechaniah, who was of the sons of Parosh, Zechariah, and with him 150 males who were in the genealogical list. Of the sons of Ahath Moab, Eliohoniah, the son of Zerahiah, and 200 males with him. And the sons of Zatu and Shechaniah, and the son of Jehaziel, and 300 males with him. And the sons of Adon, Abdid, Ebed, the son of Jonathan, and 50 males with him. And the sons of Elam, Jeshiah, the son of Athaliah and 50 males with him and the sons of Shephatiah, Zebediah and the son of Michael and 80 males with him and the sons of Joab, Obadiah, the son of Jehiel and 218 males with him and the sons of Benaim, Shelemith, the son of Josephiah and 160 males with him and the sons of Bebei, Zechariah, the son of Bebei and 28 males with him. And the sons of Asgad and Johanan, the son of Hakatan, and 110 males with him. And of the sons of Adonikam, the last ones, these being the names, Elithelet, Jewel, Shemaiah, and 60 males with him. And the sons of Bigvai, 
Uthai, Zabub, and 70 males with them. And all of those were exactly correct. So back to that list I mentioned a moment ago, just as with the first group of exiles that departed from Persia, here you see another list of the names of those who accompanied Ezra. The main thing we learn in studying the list of these names is what I told you earlier, the similarity here between these names and the ones in the original list in chapter 2. And so it seems, as you would expect here, a lot of the relatives of that first group are now those who are leaving in this second group, although 80 years later. So these are at least one or two generations after the original group, but still related. They've probably heard of the exploits of their uncles and their grandfathers and they want to go down there and join them and so on. This is the group of people who are moving with Ezra to join the exiles in the land. Look at verses 15 through 17. He says, now I assembled them at the river that runs to Ahaba, where we camped for three days. And when I observed the people and the priests, I did not find any Levites there. So I sent for Eliezer, Ariel, Shemaiah, Elnathan, Jerob, Elnathan, I guess there's two of them, Nathan, Zechariah, and Mushalam, leading men, and Joiarib, Elnathan, teachers. I sent them to Edo, the leading man at the place of Kesaphia, and I told them what to say to Edo and his brothers, the temple servants at the place of Kesaphia, that is, to bring ministers to us for the house of God. So Ezra moves the people out from the capital of Persia, but they don't go very far. They actually camp for a few days, it says, on the banks of a river called Ahava in a province of Babylon of the same name. It's the province of Ahava. At this point, Ezra realizes as they're getting ready to depart the land, you know, we don't have any Levites in this crowd. We've got all these other people. We don't have any Levites. And, of course, he's going down to support the rebuilding of the city and of the people. And as a priest himself... He knows he's going to be responsible for ensuring that they carry out the temple service properly. All aspects of the law need to be followed. And there are many aspects of the law which can only be accomplished by Levites. So he stops here as he gets ready to take his trip and he says, we've got to get some Levites in this caravan. So that's a difficult task. You know, it's hard enough to round up volunteers to serve in the church nursery. Can you imagine saying, hey, we need people to go with us on a permanent trip to another part of the world and just live there and it's not great conditions. But what do you say? You know, they're not going to get a lot of takers, you'd expect, right? And recruiting men in this way is going to be difficult. It reminds us of another time when fishermen were asked to drop their nets and follow an itinerant preacher. And yet it happens, doesn't it? It happens when God appoints. So in other words, apart from the call of the Spirit, no one is likely to make this happen. But on the other hand, because of the call of the Spirit, in the end, 38 Levites and 220 temple servants respond and join the exiles headed to Jerusalem. Look at verses 18 through 23, according to the good hand of our God upon us, they brought us a man of insight of the sons of Mahli, the son of Levi, the son of Israel, namely Sherebiah and his sons and brothers, 18 men, and Hashabiah and Jeshiah of the sons of Merari with his brothers and their sons, 20 men, and 220 of the temple servants whom David and the princes had given for the service of the Levites, all of them designated by name. Well, then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones and all our possessions. For I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way because we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably disposed to all those who seek him. But his power and his anger are against all those who forsake him. So we fasted and sought our God concerning this matter. And he listened to our entreaty. Isn't that so much like what we do? We make a decision and then we pray, God, would you bless this decision I just made? (laughs) Verse 21, you might find interesting. Verse 21 was the subject of the final sermon preached by John Robinson in the Netherlands before the pilgrims set sail for the New World in 1620. At this point, Ezra has all the men he needs. He has all the materials. He's ready to embark. And at this point, as I said earlier, he he takes note, I assume, of the fact that he's got a lot of people, a lot of goods, no soldiers. And it's a dangerous journey, as we already said. Despite their fears, we've been told he apparently refrained from asking the king for protection, which is very funny because he says in 22, I was ashamed to, to tell the king I needed his help because I just told him a minute ago that if he didn't let me go, he'd have to answer to God because God has power to dispose his enemies and It would be shameful if he just turned around the next moment and says, oh, by the way, I need your help if we're going to make it there safely. He was sensible enough to recognize the contradiction, so he never made the request. 
Similar, I guess, in the way Moses left Egypt, right? He marched out without concern under the Lord's protection. But now he's reached the brink. He's standing there contemplating what he's got to go do, facing these dangers. And he realizes, you know, I've never, never really asked for that. I never really checked in. I've sort of assumed that God is going to get us there safely. Maybe it would be smart to check with him on this one point. And he proclaims a fast as a preparation step to traveling into Jerusalem. This gives us an opportunity just to review for a brief moment why he would call a fast. The purpose of a fast is to humble ourselves, to humble ourselves before God. And in this case, he's seeking a petition of protection. Ezra's following a pattern here that's throughout the Bible. When you seek the Lord's will under circumstances where you believe you can't move forward without the Lord's reassurance. First, subdue and restrain our flesh. That's step one. If you're seeking the Lord's will concerning a decision on how to move forward. If you're truly going to discern the Lord's will... You have to make your flesh a slave. You need to discipline the flesh. Make it your slave. Because you're diminishing its influence on your thinking and on your desires. I like to think of it this way. Imagine you're a child lying in bed, as we all were at one point, and it's dark, and you think you hear a faint noise outside the window. You're scared, so you stay in bed, and you just start listening really hard. But the sound of your own heart beating and your own breathing drowns out the faint sounds that you're thinking you're hearing outside. So you hold your breath and you try to lower your heart rate so that you can detect whatever faint sound the boogeyman is making outside that window, right? Well, in a way, that's what fasting achieves. It's a practice of self-discipline designed to lower the influence of the flesh so we can more clearly hear from the Lord. It's a sacrifice done in love as a sign of our desire to grow closer to the Lord by hearing him more clearly, but it has a practical step of diminishing the influence of the flesh on our thinking and on our wanting and on our desires and on our temptations. The less of us physically that is driving our thinking, the more of God will be there. Now, I'm not saying he's powerless to overcome that if he chooses to. That's self-evidently possible. But in practical terms, the way he typically does things is to let us seek him so that we hear him. He draws us to him. He doesn't step into our world with a burning bush most of the time. That's what Ezra is doing here. Ezra is saying to his people, we don't want to make a mistake at this point. We need to hear from God clearly. Diminish self so that we can accentuate God. The next thing he does is in the seeking. Simply put, he prays seeking God's will and whether there would be protection for his people. If God isn't going to protect the people, then there's little reason for them to move forward. You might as well stay where they are. So seeking that is paramount in this case. That's why the Bible so often pairs fasting and prayer in the same sentence. Because it's two sides of the equation. Fasting is the process of turning down the noise and praying is the process of turning up God's voice. So you're working both sides of the problem. We do both in an earnest desire to seek the Lord and expect a reply because we recognize he honors those who seek him in an honest way. Having received confidence of the Lord's protection, Ezra and the camp depart for Jerusalem. And this is the last section of the chapter, verses 24 through 34. He says, then... I set apart 12 of the leading priests, Sherebiah, Hashabiah, and with 10 of their brothers, and I weighed out to them the silver, the gold, and the utensils, the offering for the house of our God, which the king and his counselors and his priests and all Israel present there had offered. Thus I weighed out into their hands 650 talents of silver and silver utensils worth 100 talents and 100 gold talents and 20 gold bowls worth 1,000 derricks, and two utensils of fine, shiny bronze, precious as gold. And then I said to them, You are holy to the Lord, and the utensils are holy, and the silver and the gold are a free will offering to the Lord God of your fathers. Watch and keep them until you weigh them before the leading priests, the Levites, and the heads of the fathers' households of Israel at Jerusalem in the chambers of the house of the Lord. So the priests and the Levites accepted the weighted out silver and gold and the utensils to bring them to Jerusalem to the house of our God. Then we journeyed from the river of Ahava on the 12th of the first month to go to Jerusalem. There's the 12th of Nisan. And the hand of our God was over us and he delivered us from the hand of the enemy and the ambushes, by the way. Thus we came to Jerusalem and remained there three days. On the fourth day, the silver and the gold and the utensils were weighed out in the house of our God in the hand of Merimoth, the son of Uriah, the priest, and with him, was Eleazar the son of Phinehas, and with them were the Levites, Josabad the son of Jeshua, and Noadiah the son of Beniel. Everything was numbered and weighed, and all the weight was recorded at that time. So Ezra comes up from his period of fasting and prayer, and he plans now 
to set out because he's been assured somehow in that prayer that this will be a successful journey. And he does something interesting. He assigns trustworthy individuals within the camp the responsibility for 28 tons of precious cargo destined for the temple. The gold, the silver, and the bronze, and all the utensils, and so on. All of that is immense wealth, which itself is interesting because we know this didn't all come from the king. We're told that they had free will offerings. And there are other extra biblical archaeological works that report that the Jews of Babylon became quite wealthy in the course of their lives while they lived in that land after they had been taken captive. Again, a further proof of God's blessing on those people, regardless of their circumstances. Remember, they weren't always slaves in Babylon, so they had a a lifestyle there. That also emphasizes the sacrifice of the ones who left and went down to Jerusalem. And then as a company, these men now custodians of all of that stuff, they're told, you hold on to this. We're counting it. We're measuring it. We're recording it now. Sort of like a receipt. You've got it. Don't lose it. And then when we get into Jerusalem, you're not to give it to anyone except when we report to the temple priests and you hand it to them in the temple. Then and only then will you relinquish control of it. And we're going to count it again then and we're going to check. That gives you just a moment of insight into the mindset of this man and into what his influence will be on the nation when he shows up on his exactitude, on his unwillingness to bend rules. Certainly there's no bending when it comes to stealing, but the point is he's exact on everything. And there will come a point as we study in chapters 9 and 10 where he will make a demand of these people that's quite extraordinary and they will have to live up to it. But as they move toward Jerusalem, we're told the Lord is faithful to protect them. I love the little added piece there. He says, even against the ambushes, which would suggest there were some ambushes. And then resting for three days, they go in and they inventory and they do all that is required. Notice there is still no clear leader. We can see Ezra as a leader of sorts for a time, and certainly teachers have that, have that role of leading to a degree, but they lead in a very specific context. They lead in the course of instruction. And as you notice, they're going to be standing up judges, which reminds us of the period of time in Israel's history before they had a king, when they had judges. So it seems to be a repetitive pattern where you have judges now leading and they're really there just to adjudicate. You never came into contact with a judge unless you had an issue of law uh, at the center of your concerns. If you were just living your everyday life, you were not being controlled so much as you might by a king. Ezra will become this leader of sorts for a time, but the nation still awaits a leader who's going to guide them. So we have two more chapters in this second step of restoration in Ezra, and we'll see that immediate impact he makes on them next week. He'll come to learn of a grave sin, and then he's going to institute a needed correction. Let's go to prayer, and we'll come back next week and finish this short book. Dear Heavenly Father, Father, from the lessons of Ezra this evening, I ask that you would remind us as time goes by the need to fast and pray, to put our flesh second to our concerns of the Spirit, of the need, Father, at times to remind ourselves of the importance of studying and obeying and sharing the word to the degree you've called us to do, and while recognizing there are others you may call to greater degrees, but none of us are without that call at some level. We ask, Father, you give us that heart to pursue these things, to place them as a priority, and if we do feel called in our heart to set everything else aside and to do these things, Father, give us the courage to step out in it. And, Lord, I ask that our witness would always be one of Ezra's witness. A man, Father, who would turn away from the world if that's necessary to do as you call us to do. A man who would seek you earnestly. A man who would call others to follow him. And a man, Father, who would choose to do what's right, no matter the cost. And we thank you, Father, for men like him that set that example and the courage to follow him. Let us come back next week. Continue to fill our room, Father, for that is a joy, bringing others to hear what we enjoy hearing too. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.